we were concerned about the um, the reports that were coming from uh, Fallujah about high levels of cancer and, and birth defects. And since uh, since it was impossible to get official data at that time, we decided to to, to run a, a survey ourselves, in which people went around and knocked on doors and asked who lived in the in the property, how many people there were there, and how many cancers there were, what sort of cancers, how many children had died in the last five years, uh, and all, all these sort of prob all all of these questions. The, the questions about cancer were answered. And, and uh, we then analysed the cancer data that we got over the last five years by comparing it with cancer rates in Egypt and in um, Jordan as a sort of background. And what we found that the levels of cancer were enormously high. Uh, for, all, uh, for all cancers, uh, the, the rates were extraordinarily high and even higher than uh, Hiroshima, because I've already studied, I've studied the the effect, the health effects of the Hiroshima disaster d bombing, um, uh, which are which are quite well recorded, and what we found was that the levels of cancer in Fallujah were higher than that, and the particular cancers that we found were cancers associated with radiation, uh, and these were leukemia, and particularly leukemia in children and also leukemia, uh, lymphoma, lymphoma in children, that's another disease that you get from radiation, um, or we believe so. And so obviously that together with other, other information we got from this study, which was the high level of infant mortality, that deaths of children within the first year, and the causes of, the, of these deaths, which were congenital malformations, putting all of that together, together with a, a, a skewed birth birth sex ratio, which is another sign of um, genetic damage associated with radiation exposure. Uh, we found, put all of that stuff together and we, we concluded that there had been some very large genetic damage event which occurred around about the time of the uh, Fallujah War. At that time, although we suspected that it was depleted uranium, we didn't know that, and we particularly pointed out that we couldn't say anything about what caused it at that point, although we went on later to do another study in which we did find out what caused it. And what prompted your investigation in the first place? How and why did you end up in Fallujah? Well, I, I, I was um, on the depleted uranium committee of the Ministry of Defence, the British Ministry of Defence, um, because there had been lots of reports of uh, ill health associated with serving in the Gulf War by British soldiers, Ministry of Defence. I gave evidence on this to the uh, American Congressional Committee on Depleted Uranium, and, and they put me on, on the board of the Ministry of Defence looking into this, this, this factor. And because of that, from about 1999 onwards, I was increasingly interested in how it was that uranium, which is not terribly radioactive substance, could, could be causing Gulf War syndrome and all the congenital malformation effects that were slowly emerging in the British soldiers and also in the American soldiers. So about that time, I was quite interested in uranium and its effects. And I was approached by a woman, an Iraqi woman called Malak Hamdan, who uh, had lived out in, in, in uh, Fallujah, I believe, and knew the doctor there, Dr. Samira Alani, who had been reported to her, reporting to her all these enormous levels of congenital malformation. So I said to her, she said, well, how can we how can we prove this? Because the, the authorities are just denying that there is a problem. And yet, you know, all the doctors are saying there is a problem. So how can we prove it? So I said, well, we can do an epidemiological study. We can go out there. We just need a bit of money. And somebody goes around, knocks on doors and asks who lives there, how old are they? And, and, and all the questions that we that we asked in, in this study, which was quite hard to do because there was no electricity at the time. So we had to buy them a generator and we had to buy them computers and printers to print up all the leaflets and they all had to be the questionnaires all had to be translated into Arabic. So I was dependent entirely on, on, on if you like, our soldiers out there in Fallujah, because at that time I couldn't go out there. In fact, I wouldn't have been much good. My, my position was to, to devise the study, to write the questionnaires and to analyze the results that came back. And how can we be certain that it was depleted uranium that caused this spike in cancer rates? Maybe this was just some sort of unfortunate coincidence. 
Well, it certainly wasn't an unfortunate coincidence, but what we can say for certainty from the epidemiology is that the the uh, the probability of this occurring by chance was vanishingly small. You can do you can do statistics to show that it's more or less impossible for this to happen unless there had been some cause. But the question is, what is the cause? Um, the, the Americans refused to, to, to admit that they were using uranium. So what we decided to do is we decided to look in the hair. There's a method called ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, in which you can take a hair sample and you can dissolve it in acid and then you can measure the atoms inside the hair sample and see what the concentration of all these different elements are. So we looked at 52 elements in the hair of 20 mothers of children with congenital malformations. And we found that there was an anomalously high level of uranium. The only, the only anomaly we found uh, associated with a, an element which can cause congenital malformations was with uranium. And we found that. But not only that, what we did is we looked at women. There was the, the, the Arab women have very long hair. And so what we did is we got some women with very long hair, very, very long hair. And, hair, and we know the rate at which hair grows, you see. So what we could do is we could cut the hair into little little slices and we could measure the uranium in each of the slices going right back to the first bit, which is like today. And the second bit is like last year, if you like, and the next bit is the year before that and so on. So we can get a graph of the uranium in the hair going right the way back to about 2005. And what we found is that it went up. The uranium went up as we went back in time. So clearly there was an increase in uranium around right about the time or just after Fallujah um, battle, uh, which then reduced uh, as time went on, obviously, because it got excreted from the system. So so we had a pretty good idea by then that, that we had more or less proof, I think, that uranium was the cause of all of these uh, congenital malformations and genetic damage and sex ratio and cancer. And the cancer was extraordinarily high. Yeah. Most of our readers are not scientists, they're lay people. Could you explain to them in lay person's terms why depleted uranium can cause an increase in genetic malformation, cancers? I mean, because when people hear the term depleted uranium, it sounds scary, but they don't exactly understand what it is and why it can have such damaging effects. Okay. Well, two things. First of all, depleted uranium is a byproduct of the nuclear industry that separates uh, uranium into uh, highly enriched uranium or enriched uranium, which they use for nuclear weapons or for nuclear power. And what's left behind is a uranium which which hasn't got the, the highly um, radioactive or, or fissile, that stuff that can go bang, uranium-235 inside it. So it's a sort of waste product. Uranium itself is extremely dense, so it has a density of about 20 compared to lead, which is about 10. So it's very, very heavy. But that's not why it's useful in tank warfare. The reason it's useful in tank warfare is because when you shoot it at a hard target, like a tank, it catches fire and it burns at an extraordinarily high temperature, thousands of degrees. And when it does so, it, 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 um, it burns its way through the tank armor. And as it goes into the tank, the ex expansion of the heat associates of the air associated with the heat blows the top of the tank off. So I, I walked into, I've seen lots of tanks in Kuwait in the border there. I went there in 2000 and I've seen lots of tanks that have been damaged by depleted uranium and they're radioactive. So re the other thing about depleted uranium about the, is it is radioactive. It's, it, it's, it's weakly radioactive, but it is radioactive. Uh, but the most important thing about it is that it is that uranium for a long time has been known to bind very strongly to DNA. Now DNA is the target for all radiation effects. It's, if you if you're looking at the reason why radiation causes genetic damage and cancer, um, it's been well accepted since the 1950s that it's that is since the discovery of DNA in 52 that the DNA is the target for all this genetic effect. And since uranium binds to it very strongly, it has a strong chemical affinity for DNA. And this has also been known for a very long time 
uranium nitrate was used for since 1960s as a as a stain as an electron microscope stain so you you take your cells and you shake them up with uranium nitrate and the the uranium sticks to the chromosomes and so when you fire the electrons in and you look through the microscope you can see the chromosomes there they all are because they've got uranium on them now if uranium is radioactive and it attacks the chromosomes it binds to the chromosomes and clearly it's going to be very very much more dangerous than just the idea that it's some kind of neutral substance that, that, that you, you, you drink and then it goes out of your body and so on. It, it's a calcium seeker and it binds to DNA. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it was discovered actually mostly by me or, or, or it was reported to the depleted uranium oversight board in 2004 that uranium has another property because it has a very high atomic number if you look at the periodic table you have all these atomic numbers it starts with hydrogen one helium two lithium sodium and all the way down to the very heavy elements right at the end uranium has got the highest atomic number of any element on earth of course the new ones now like plutonium but the up, up until the discovery of the, the, fish, the fission of uranium uranium had the highest atomic number which is 92 and because of this it 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 acts as a sort of amplifier for normal radiation, natural background radiation. So we all live in an environment where we get gamma rays that come through our body and go out and of course that they're, they're not good and they have an effect. But if you've got uranium inside you, then it intercepts this because of its high atomic number and all its electrons. And when when it when it gets hit by a gamma ray, it shoots off a load of electrons uh, and this is called the photoelectric effect. It's the same effect that's used in photocells when you when you point a, a, a photocell at light a light meter, and then you get these electrons, and that tells you how much light there is. So this is called the photoelectric effect, and, and in my opinion, and I've written quite a lot about this, this is the reason why uranium is very dangerous. First of all, it binds to DNA. Secondly, it causes these photoelectrons to be emitted into the DNA, and all studies that have been done of people exposed to uranium show massive chromosome damage. So when they look to see the chromosomes in their cells, in the peripheral blood cells and so on, they find massive amounts of chromosome damage. And this of course, chromosome damage is the same thing that leads through to all these genetic effects of cancer and, and the birth defects and so forth. So that's the reason why uranium is so dangerous. And I've seen a lot lately since these arguments about from President Putin about you know, being very upset about the idea that the British are going to use uranium. Um, it, he's absolutely right. And the British are saying, oh, no, no, it's perfectly safe. It's not even radioactive and nobody has to worry about it and so on. This is quite wrong and dangerously so. Yeah. So they, am I correct in understanding that basically, do, even though it's used on the battlefield, uranium is able to spread in such a way that even though, let's say, it's used against a tank on the battlefield, it's able to contaminate other surfaces, which then can contaminate civilians. The, the reason is that the temperature is so high when, when the uranium um, burns, it's called pyrophoric. When it burns, the temperature so high is it produces particles which are so small that they're effectively a gas. Uh, you know that, that they, when you get to particles, uh, what, what we call nanoparticles, less less than about a micron, and that's what these are. Their mean diameter is about one tenth of a micron. They don't behave as a metal particle like you could imagine dropping a ball bearing. You know, they they behave like a gas, and they just are totally volatile and they float all over the place. Um, so they they contaminate. They contaminate distances. In not in 2006, we looked at the the first Gulf War effects. No, 2003, we looked at, at, at filters in the United Kingdom that measure uranium, and we showed that they came from Iraq all the way to England. <laughs> and of course, more recently, the same thing with, with Ukraine. Yeah. And you, and the start of our conversation, you compared the after effects in Iraq to Hiroshima. That's a very powerful statement. Could you elaborate what exactly are the similarities that you found between the situation in Iraq and Hiroshima? Well, first of all, they are the effects of exposure to radiation. So that, I mean, Hiroshima has come to define the effects of radiation. 
uh, and it was a very, very high level of external radiation, like standing in front of a big flash bulb when it went off. And the radiation went through the body of most people, came out the other side, but on the way it caused a load of genetic damage, which then fed through to uh, cancer um, effects, which have been, been, been elaborated by a lot of epidemiological studies in Japan the lifespan study, they followed people who were exposed right through their lifespan and counted up the numbers of cancers that there were. So that's radiation. Now, we're saying that there's also radiation from inside the body, from these, these particles, which, which um, contaminated people in Fallujah. Of course, once the particle is inside you, it doesn't go away. So it's not like you get a big flash and that's it, it's all gone. You've got a particle sitting inside you for the rest of your life you know, shooting off little cannonballs all the time close into, into the cells. So that's also radiation. So when we want to see the effects of Hiroshima, we do a lifespan study and we look at all of the people in Hiroshima and see how many cancers there are compared to the exposure. But here we do the same thing. So I went along and I asked people how many cancers there were. And we've got no reason to suppose that they lied. In fact, we've got names and addresses and the doctor's names and addresses and all the rest of it. And what it shows is, it, like it showed with Hiroshima, an enormously high level of cancer. But to our astonishment, the level of cancer we find in Fallujah is higher than the level by, by a factor of about two or maybe more, depending upon the cancer. So what we see in Fallujah is a, is a more serious cancer producing effect from the exposures that occurred there from uranium to the exposures that occurred in Hiroshima. While I say that, I have to say that the, that the Hiroshima cancers have recently in the last five years been associated not with the exposure to the external radiation, but exposure to uranium, because the, when the bomb exploded in Hiroshima, um, only 5% of it fissioned, the 95% of it just blew apart into particles. And those particles came down in Hiroshima in the form of rain, which is called the black rain. And in the last year or two, the, the, the Japanese have conceded that people who were uh, exposed to the black rain and got cancer got their cancer because of exposure to the uranium in the black rain and nothing to do with the with the, um, the, the the gamma radiation from the flash because they were too far away. People more than five kilometers away from the hypocenter were getting cancer, but they were out in the black rain and they were exposed to this this, this these uranium particles in the same way as the people in the uranium particles. I mean, what you're describing sounds like a public health nightmare. What, how was the Iraqi health care system able to deal with it? What, to what extent was it able to cope with the strain produced by these problems? Well, first of all, there's not much they can do. I mean, I visited various hospitals when I went there to Iraq, and I talked to the doctors. In fact, I talked to the medical officer of health there. And, of course, they, did, they didn't have at that time, this is 2000, this is before the Second World War, and they were suffering the effects of the of the uranium 300 you know a lot of 300 tons i think used in the first gulf war and um they they said that they couldn't do anything for the cancer uh, people because they didn't have access to drugs because of all the sanctions but to be honest there's not much you can do i mean if you got the, the sorts of pictures that we see that i have in fact of the children with congenital malformations, there's nothing you can do except throw your hands up and, and, and wait for them to die. And that's what, and I did talk to a number of families there while I was in the hospitals and looking at the poor children with leukemia or with some big lump on their throat or whatever, lying there in bed, and they were going to die, but they're going, they were going to die, that's it. They're going to die, there's nothing you can do. And the contamination of, of that area is a public health a, a nightmare. It's exactly what it is, it's a public health nightmare. And it's a public health nightmare because the doctors can't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Nothing. Wow. And was there any sort of family or incident that particularly stuck out to you in your memory that really sort of helped highlight how serious of a problem of, of how serious a public health nightmare this whole situation was? What 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 I what brought home to me the public health nightmare were the numbers. I, I'm a numbers person. I, I, I'm a scientist. I'm, I try, the work I do, I have to step aside. I have to try and step aside from, from the reality of, of the numbers that I see. I, I mean, I visited, the, as I told you, the hospitals and I saw a few children there who were clearly dying, you know, and um, 
this also happened after Chernobyl and after after Fukushima, and and all you can try to do is to try and stop it happening by by arguing that the numbers show what they show, and so in this situation with the Ukraine uranium, um, what I what I need to show is I need to to mobilise what I know about the numbers to, to demonstrate that what's happening is a public health nightmare, and it's not it's not constrained to Iraq because the stuff from Iraq came to England. I mean, obviously not as much of it, but every small amount of it that came to England was inhaled by somebody and went into their lung, and then it was translocated into their into their body. And now, and now we see, in, I mean, I have done this for 30 years. I have seen the cancer rates increasing in the West and in, in Europe by enormous factors, enormous levels of cancer increase. Now, now we have a situation where, where we almost one in two person will get cancer. And when I started this in the 90s, it was one in five. And this is not because, an, this is not because of, uh, as they say, as, as, as the doctors who in the government say, because of, a, a, an aging population. It's not because of an aging population, because young people are getting cancer. People at 25 are getting colon cancer, and there has to be a reason for this. And it could easily be these particles that, they, that you, you inhale one, you, you cough it up, you swallow it down into your gut, it gets into your lower intestine, and it gets trapped in the epithelium, in the folds of the intestine, and it just sits there shooting its, shooting its little bullets into the DNA for the rest of your life until you get a tumour. And so am I correct in understanding that, let's say, you know, these ammunition are deployed in the battlefield of Ukraine, somewhere in the east. Am I correct in <coughs> yes. thinking that it wouldn't be contained to that area, but we would likely see it spread to other parts of Europe and maybe even other parts of the world? Correct. That's what the, that's what the evidence shows, because these measurements, the, the, these data, which I have from the atomic weapons establishment in Alden Austin, who had to put these filters up by law around about 1992 as, because of increases in childhood leukemia around the plants. And they continued to measure uranium in the filters. And these show that the, at the beginning of the war, February 2022, there was a sudden huge increase, a significant increase in uranium in the filters, which continued up until now more or less. Uh, and the only possible explanation for that is that somebody is using uranium and generating uranium particles somewhere. And obviously the only place that that, well, the most likely place for that to be, since since my since my previous control period was right back to 2017, and you didn't see anything at all. So it's just going along and going along, going along pretty flat until you get to February 2022 and up it goes. And so I guess that does beg the question, uh, you know, wait, just to go a bit back, uh, when you were rep coming to your conclusions in Iraq and reporting the results, did, what sort of reaction did you get from U.S. officials, U.K. officials? Were they receptive to your findings? Were they open-minded about what you had discovered? No, they were very hostile. Um, I'm, I mean, I've been on two British government committees relating ra to radiation, and as far as as far as the British government is concerned, um, I, I'm I'm their bet ma. They really don't like anything that I say. In fact, I but I went in I went into a court case. I was asked to to be an expert in a in a coroner's jury about a, a, a Gulf War veteran, Mr. Dyson, who died of colon cancer. You recall I was just talking about colon cancer and particles, and he was a Gulf War veteran. He fought in the first Gulf War and he developed colon cancer and died. And so the 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 coroner, who, whose job it is, is to decide why he died. He 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 actually took the went as far as to, as to call a jury, 13 people to come in and listen to these arguments. And so the Ministry of Defense sent a representative to argue that, radiation, that, that uranium was harmless and couldn't have caused his cancer. And I was asked to say the opposite or to say what it is I believe. And so I brought in my evidence and they brought in their evidence and the jury found totally for, for, for what I said, that the colon cancer in this man, Stuart Dyson, was caused by the uranium. But of course, you must understand that the British and the Americans, to them, this is a magical weapon. This is a weapon that kills tanks. Uh, Saddam Hussein had all these uh, Russian tanks down on the on the Kuwait border. 
and they were all destroyed by the by the depleted uranium bullets from the A-10 Warthog aircraft, you know. One after another, they, they just ping, 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 the tops blew off and they were radioactive and so on. It's a magic it's a magic weapon when it comes to tank warfare and it's inconceivable that the military would would allow anyone to stop them using that in in a real war where you want to win the war and they don't really care about the people that that that, that die as a result of all of this the, the the you know the collateral damage they would call it um the cancers downwind the congenital malformations the weeping parents and all the rest of it I have to I have to not think myself too much about about the reality of all of that. I, I just I just do the numbers and, and say, well, look, this is what they show. And there's no argument. There's no argument. This is what they show. But, but the British government just refused to concede it. And when the coroner wrote to the Ministry of Defense and said, look, you know, we, the, the, the coroner jury has found that that depleted uranium caused this person's cancer. They wrote back and said, well, we don't we don't agree with you. And he wrote, he wrote back and he said, well, I'm not asking you to agree with me. It's just the law that I have to tell you that this is what they found. And this is what they found. And this is the truth. This is what there is. This stuff binds to DNA and it destroys the DNA and causes genetic malformations. And I guess for my final question is, obviously the issue of depleted uranium is back in the news because of the announcement that the United Kingdom would send this ammunition to Ukraine. Are there any sort of thoughts warnings that you want to offer on this topic given you know the recent decision by the british government well i've only got one thing to say here that in this case president putin has accurately identified this as a as a weapon if you like a weapon of mass destruction a weapon of indiscriminate effect and the british and the americans continue to cling to their their crazy theory that this radioactive substances which binds to DNA is harmless, effectively harmless, and has no um, genetic effects or, or, or indiscriminate effects on population. So, so, so in this case, I just have to say that the British are wrong, that this stuff is contaminating Europe, and it will cause all of the effects that it causes, caused in Iraq, and that I've shown to have been caused in Iraq, it will cause all those effects in Germany and Luxembourg and France and Sweden and the Baltic states and, you know, long list of countries which are which which stand between Ukraine and the United Kingdom where we measured it. Yeah, and thank you so much for your time and expertise, Dr. Busby. I'm sure for our readers and listeners, this was a very difficult pill to swallow. But I think it's very important that they understand the science behind depleted uranium. So well, thank you know, so much. democracy is, is, is run, run on the basis of, of, of truth, on the basis of, of, of perfect knowledge. And if people in a democracy have perfect knowledge that something their government is doing that is, is killing them, then they ought to get another government quickly.